Well, today's show is all about laying tracks. Let's bring on a man who can really lay down a track to introduce the show today. If you're not looking for trouble, you'll come to the right place. Well, my name's Andy, and this is my channel, Model Oco, for all things Model Railway and a little bit of Elvis because we're celebrating today. And uh, who knows when I reach the next milestone who I'll be. But for now, I'm going to get this clobber off and uh, we'll get back on with the show. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps us sane, although you might doubt that, but you've got to have a laugh at times. Okay, on the table, I've put some set track, double O at the top, third down to second, and below that, TT 120, third radius down to second radius, and underneath the Pico Flexi Track that's only available from them at the moment in the UK. You can buy Tillig, I suppose, but Hornby have promised some, we'll see. If you wanted to branch out from Hornby Set Track, for instance, well, this track doesn't come with uh, track joiners fixed, it doesn't come with sleeper holes drilled, ready to put your track pins in, so how do we put it down? So I'm going to look at that, but the advantage of this is endless. You can go where you want and get some very natural sweeping curves if you're designing a specific station or part of a track and you want a lovely sweeping S-bend or something like that, this is the thing to go with. There's a slight difference in code as we've discussed in other videos and there's a slight difference in profile as well from double O gauge to TT120. It's a bit more like N-Gage's TT120 where there's a groove in the sleeper itself under where the track sits and some extra profiling. So let's get underway and let's get laying some track. Right, we're in the shed. Whether it's Code 100 double O gauge or TT120, I use this sticky on one side foam. But all I do is cut the end off square if it isn't already, turn the track over, Peel it back a little bit like that, stick it on, just overlap it on the end a little bit and work one's way down. And I like using this because it gives them corners, so that, that's on. Put it back over, get your scissors or Stanley knife, give it a cut, chop that for next time. That can go in the bin. Put your fingers down it like that just to secure it. It does peel off. You can peel it off once it's on if you don't get it stuck right. And I've had this in the loft 10 years, as I say, it's never batted an eyelid. I mean, some people get foam sheets and you can put it, put this stuff all over or use cork, but I like this. And it's a nice color as well for ballasting. And the lift that you get is good for the undulation of the ballast. And then get your Stanley knife, it just, it sticks a little bit on the first bit and then just run it down the side and you can use this for TT and double O. So, it's what I use for double O. So, and just peel it back, roll that up, point, bin that and you've got a piece of track ready for laying. Piece of cake, first bit done. While we're on the subject of craft knives, I like a Stanley knife. Get yourself some cheap third party blades and they just mount of course in the handle. There's always a couple that come with a Stanley knife but they soon go blunt and they get sticky so make sure you keep them clean and keep your fingers away from the edge. The other sort of craft knives I like, the Stanley ones, they come in packs of three, the throwaway ones. These are absolutely rubbish because the blade constantly moves. So forget them. <laughs> On set track, of course, it's already pre-drilled and it's already pre-set as well, it's already pre-formed. But when you want to start moving and branching out, that's when you need to go flexi track. But that said, we need to get some little holes drilled in for the track pins. Now you might say now, well, do I need the underlay? No, you don't. You might also say, well, can't I just glue it down? Copy decks is the thing if you're going to glue it. We can glue the baseboard, we can glue the back of that because it's only sticky on one side. And then we can put it down and we can rest, you know, rest it for a few hours with something heavy on top. Don't use no more nails. If you do, you'll never get it back up again. And if you want to move it, copy decks always is rubbery. 
so it will let your track come back up okay but I always like to pin and I have one of these now it comes with all them attachments yeah it's cordless you get all the bits with it they're very cheap and cheerful now you don't have to pay hundreds of pounds anymore but before that I used to use a couple of these and they're cheap as well so I've used them in the past but you always, you've always got the wire following you about what size drill do a drill for the pins millimetre drill put a millimetre drill in and you're all right for your pins okay so you get millimetre drills in packs of 10 I think on eBay or anything like that Amazon wherever you want to go how far apart are we going to put our pins you can do it wherever you want it depends how tight your curves are where it is but yeah classically lay your tape rule out and on TT track about once every 200 mil you can put one at the start and then every 200 mil down you'll start to see once you've done it for a while where you want these holes to be at first it's your best sticking to measurements but eventually your eyes will just normally go to it maybe 250 apart on double O once we get the track drilled and don't forget if you are going to drill use some gligs I've already got my gligs on or you can use these as well they're very good and they've got a little torch on not as good as Elvis but you know they look, they're not trendy but they do the job I like them I, I do like them for if you're not wanting to change glasses and if you do wear glasses and you need reading glasses or you just want to own in a little bit these are the perfect things to have so you can get your drill then and I just like to guide it get it about in the center like that and once we've gone down the whole track work your way down your track at 10 mil 20 mil in at the end you're ready to start putting it down on your layout now one of the things that people um, also use for drilling baseboards and for drilling their sleepers are one of these little tools we've got a little chuck on the end which means the bit that nips the drill which is obviously you can use the same drill as the ones we find in here this locks you hold it down you hold the chuck down and just give that a nip and it comes out put it in here just nip it up keep the flutes of the drill the flutes of the drill little spouts that go up the drill they get full of plastic and stuff as you're drilling so you put your finger on there and that will drill a hole and they are fantastic I mean that will drill the plastic even easier you're gonna want to start to curve it to suit your layout so you can go from the edge and the great thing about this is you can go wherever you want you're starting to do your curves the best thing I found are these radius gauges off eBay and I'll put a link under and I think they're about 17 quid come with like a green film on that you just peel off so if you see them on eBay they'll be like colored green but you get seven radius gauges the R to TT 120 geometry not you know like if we're thinking about double o gauge pico track setters are not the same kettle of fish they're a different geometry to hornby set track where these match so they're a great little tool they don't push in all the way like these do they just push right in they are superior but they're a lot more expensive and they're not the same geometry as set track we've established that if i want to get the same geometry as a third radius I can then just put this in here like so that's it there we go it sort of has a bit of a click to it when you're putting Pico flexible track you're not going too tight for your trains because you don't really want to go any tighter than a second radius right on a main line so yeah these just then just click in and then of course once you start doing that it will push and pull the rails at the end 
and with these being sat in a groove, they're a bit harder to manipulate than say this. And these straight ones, you think, oh, why, why, why would I need a straight one? Well, because they just straighten your track out and you run up and down like that and you've straightened your track, yeah? Fantastic, eh? If you want to get that back straight again, oh no, just use your straight one. And boom, you're back straight. It won't run up and down like that one does. That's great. You can do that. That won't run up and down. It sticks in, but they're fantastic. They have got pre-drilled holes in them that you could actually use to put your holes through your track, you see? So you can use them. I didn't use them because they don't always quite line up. But if you're a bit unsure about where you want to get your hole and you want it right in the center and you're really finicky, then use that. Get your drill and you're straight in then, aren't you? And you will get used to that as well. At first your drill drifts, only small drills, so don't try and force it through. Don't try and bend the drill because they'll just break. And as we discussed before in other videos, this is a nicer sleeper. The different code tracks very slightly. They do go together at a push, but I'm going all Pico. And once you move on from the oval and once you move on from set track, then flexible track is the way to go. You're more into professional modeling. We all get better the more we do it. We could all be professionals at this. Just start having a go. Don't be scared. If you break and a few pieces of track or you get stuff wrong, have a practice, that's part of it. You know, if it costs you five quid to ruin a piece of track, it, it's worth it to learn the curve. Go slowly and steadily away and you should be all right. Right, so I've cleared the decks and I've got the soldering gear out and I've made a cup of tea because we're looking at TT and double O gauge flexi track. And like we said, neither come with anything like this that Hornby supply in set track and other companies do with set track where you have the wires that you just put in to one of these terminal blocks already fitted on the track. They're just a plain piece of track. We've drilled it, we've put the underlay on, but now we want to get what we call dropper feed wires. And these are wires that we attach to either select where we put our power to the track or where we have um, certain feeds, um, but it's usually a power source to get power down the track to feed the locomotive. So yeah, on double O, I'm gonna switch over to a little video that I did some time ago in the kitchen to show how I get these wires onto that. And then we'll have a look at this. I will just say at this point as well, if you really, really don't want to solder your rail, then you could always go for some power feed joiners from Pico. They come in, they come in packs of eight, they're not cheap, £8.80 recommended retail price. But these are PL80 for double O gauge and PL82 for TT120 or N gauge. And these will sit under your rail. I would advise that if you're going to use them as a power feed, then um, don't have them between the sort of track ends. Push them right on and use another fish plate to join your track. Um, that said, they should work either way and if you're in a bit of a rush or anything like that that will get you going or if you haven't got a soldering iron so before i do go any further what wire do i use now i use a hundred meter lens to save money and i get black and red twin core that means it's got a black a black sheath and a red sheath they'll try and sell you every other color under the sun but i want black and red and it doesn't really ma matter which way you put it round, as long as you remember which way you do it. So you can either put black to the back or red to the rear. You know, it depends how you want to do it. Um, just so you remember that you always wire it the same way round. Obviously you don't want one piece of track, track wired that way and the other track wired the opposite. Otherwise you're gonna get a short. But yeah, I use twin core and it's, two pieces of 0.5 millimeter cable. 
and it's just speaker cable. I found that company about the cheapest so far. There was another company a little bit cheaper, but they gave me the runaround and were a little bit naughty about the price. So I stopped using them, sadly. Bought two reels off them in the past, but not anymore. So that's the company I'm using at the moment. I'll put a little link up on the screen. Um, I use a helping hand as well for when you're getting your, because you always need three sets of arms. <laughs> you need to be Buddha sometimes, or well, that's how you feel. And I don't really use this magnifier. I just use sometimes the um, soldering iron base station here. And as you can see, I've had quite a few soldering irons in my time, but the one I use for double O gauge track has been the 30 watt iron. I've since bought this, which um, still got the wire of course, but it's onto a battery so you can take it anyway, you can go out in the garden, you can go up in the loft. You're not limited to a power supply, get a spare battery. Luckily I've got a garden appliance that has the same battery as this, so I already had a spare battery. And then you just plug that in, and I found that this modern tip is a lot better than these tips. You can spend a fortune and you can spend very little, but I found this to be really good. So I'll tell you again when I solder this track with this iron this time. But as I say, we're gonna look at a video in a minute with me soldering with my 30 watt iron in the kitchen. And then before we solder the wire on, it's what we're gonna strip it with. And of course, there's all sorts of things from your <laughs> classic pair of scissors. <laughs> We've all done that, chop round carefully, then you end up chopping your wire. But when you're doing a lot of dropper feed wires like these, or bus cables, whatever you want, for want of a better word to call them, you're gonna need something pretty quick and sharp. Now there's these that can cut your wire and strip your wire. As long as you remember which one it is you put it in, you just put it in there, give it a pull and away you go. That iron's already eating up, it's ready for me, look. So you can just turn it off. Uh, and you just pull that and it strips the wire. And the little bit of cable falls away. I've been using these. These are very cheap and cheerful. Little nut and lock nut. Once you've set, you get your scissors, chop your cable, pull your ends open as far as you want, get these on, just keep them oiled. Mine have gone a little bit stiff because I'm not oiling them, so I need to just put a bit of oil on. And then just pull like that. Only thing is, sometimes the bit of sheath gets stuck in the jaws and it can be a little bit annoying by the time you've done about 50. But uh, that said, and then I go in about mm, half an inch. You see how it sticks? Half an inch and then just twist the cable round like that. Get a good, you know, look at the copper um, content of your cable and how many strands. Um, and I found this is the best. You want a, a good performance from your cable. So that's why I've gone for the more loudspeaker cable, especially when you're doing long runs. I mean, I'm 16, about 16 meters to the house. So half of that, some of the feeds are coming to the shed and the other feeds are going back to the house. So you, some are running eight meters, seven, eight meters long. So you want a good feed. Oh, before I forget, there is one other thing to mention on wire. I used to use this wire as well, and I bought it quite naively. It looked a little bit more um, sort of accommodating than this. Um, and yeah, it, it, it peels back all right. It cuts all right. It works all right. Oh, God, I'm gonna have to oil these. <laughs> But they are good, they are good, I promise. <laughs> it, you know, it's got enough copper in. Uh, it's good wire, I can't knock it, but the only issue is with it, it's got this outer sheath on to get to these two under it, and you've constantly got to pull this back all the time. Great for accessories, I suppose. And that's another reason you put your drop of feed wires on to feed a light, maybe in a house, or a, a flickering welding unit, or something like that. You might take a power feed from it. So that's my, where you might have another drop of wire on your, on your track. But yeah, it's great wire. It's just a shame it had this outer sheathing on. Solder. It says £5.50 on this. Now I've had this years. I'm not going for rosin-based fluxes or using rosin gels because there is a lot said that they might be bad 
for asthmatics. I'm not asthmatic, but I don't want to be breathing all that in. I've enough with the lead content. You can get lead free, it's coming out. I've not tried it apart from um, once and it didn't melt. So maybe if you're paying about 40 quid a roll, you'll get something that does, but they all say lead's the best thing. But you want to be in a ventilated area and you want to keep um, your nose out the way of the fumes. If it does it your nose, it's a nasty acrid smell. So you don't really want that. Have some flux as well. I've just got this Copper Lux flux and you just dip your ends of your wires in like, like so and then offer your soldering iron up and it's called tinning. So you just tin the end of your wire with your solder as you heat it up and run it on before you attach it to your track. You get a nice blob on to your track, uh, onto the back of your track without melting your sleepers. And you always want to solder either to the outside of your rail or the underside. That's where I do it so it's out of sight. And both bits will then, as you see, once, once, once they're on, you'll see more on the other video, they face inwards. So then when you place your track on your board, you can just drill one little five mil hole and your dropper wires will go through. Yeah. And same for points, same for covering them in the, um, in the foam that I've used. I just use a straight piece and they work fine. There's no issue with them, they're TT. The double O's are the same, the foam backing goes on. You've just got to cut a little bit of an extra bit there, but you can cut two angles and it makes for two points at once. And it sticks on just like that, so that's the underlay. And you might have to put some dropper feed wires on your points as well. And if you do, what I've done, instead of putting the droppers on the actual point itself, I'll put a little bit of extra track here. If I'm isolating the next point um, of the track, for block detection, which we'll talk about on insulating joiners in another video. Then I'd put the dropper feeders on that and then um, fix it to the point. But that said, it's all swings and roundabouts, how you want to do it and which way you want to go forward. And you want somewhere, when you've stopped using your iron, to put your iron back. It can either be in your helping hand or if you're using electric so uh, soldering iron like this or one of these battery operated ones, it's nice to have a bit of this a base station like that with that foaming where you can just wipe the end of your soldering iron as you're using it and put it, put it back. Obviously, make sure your wire isn't in a place where you can knock it or it's going to be pulled like that. So I'll just go in there like that. And get yourself a little LED powered with a bulb in. Just put a little watch battery in, I think. Is it a watch battery? Oh no, two normal sized batteries in. Cheapest chips now out of the batteries. They go in the handle and they're good if you haven't got your reading glasses or you haven't got them to hand or you haven't got a battery in that or you just want to light some up, just get that in and you can see. So a little magnifier is good as well. Right, keep your tape rule at hand, keep your wire strippers and there's some RS wire strippers, um, handheld ones that clip or you can get the more expensive trigger base ones that some modelers use and they look fabulous but they, they are set to certain gauges of wire. So you'll get one for that gauge, then if you go up to a thicker wire, you need a bigger one. And they're about 40 quid each. They look brilliant. They do the job just with one click. Um, but, you know, I, I've i managed with these. And sometimes when I've done about, on the local lift, when I did about 40 tracks, um, I got to about 30 and I thought, oh, I wish I had some of those RS ones. But that said, I found them better, actually, than them and easier to hold and manipulate and grab hold if you want it quick and you want to be on with the job, don't you? Especially if you're doing a lot. Let's get into the house, show you the video I did soldering double O. Track, all good. Okay, well, Poppy, the cat is asleep, but she's with me. Um, I'm gonna solder double O gauge, code 100, Pico, flexible track. And a simple technique to get that solder to flow on, lovely. And it's all about being a little bit more patient. I'm going to set my timer and I've got size 10 that is um, 0.7 millimeters diameter already soldering wire with flux built into it so it's uh, called multi-core 
five core with resin in it, uh, tin lead 6040. So you can, if you're doing a lot of soldering, wear a bit of a mask, which I've got here, and put some gloves on if you want, protective gloves to stop the um, soldering lead or whatever coming off on your fingers. Piece of timber to stop your um, modeling mat melting because the track can get hot. Um, I've got my helping hand for tinning my uh, dropper wires. And here we go. So, set the plot, get the soldering iron. It's a 30 watt soldering iron. So it's about a standard one. It's not too small, otherwise you'll never heat the track up. And it's not too big. Right, so we'll start the plot. So put the soldering iron onto the track. And here's the secret. Don't go straight in with your solder. Wait just a little bit longer than you think you ought to. It's not copper wire. This is nickel silver. And it's quite thick compared to the point, the scriber point on the soldering iron. So we're going to wait 25 seconds. Okay, that's it. And offer it up. And then just run your soldering iron a little bit round. And <laughs> it's not gone the same. It's not happened, has it? And there we are, look. There's the blob. All right, let's start again. So I'd say we need to wait. So we're going to do the other track now. And I'd say we need to wait about 25 seconds. So we start the clock. Put the soldering iron on. If it's been in the holster, um, it can cool the soldering iron down a little bit. We've got the door open, so we don't want to be breathing in the fumes. So the secret is to wait just over 20 seconds. And I like to wait 25 with a 30 kilowatt iron. So coming up to 25 seconds. It seems a long time, but then the soldier just goes straight on onto the track without any monkey business. <laughs> it says, sod's low and what are you doing? Right there, and you've got a nice little, nice little couple of, nice little couple, oh, if we can get the camera, nice little couple of blobs on there now. And it hasn't tainted the track or anything. So that's how to solder your track. Okay, so what am I gonna do with this? Well, this, as we say, is a little bit different to double O. But I always put my track underlay on first and then decide where I want my dropper wire so I can manipulate that on the layout and say I want it about here. I try not to go right in the centre, I try to keep to one end and then these sleepers will pull out of the way to put that on. So I'll probably go about 100, 200 mils back, not on a, not where I've drilled it or anything like that and then just cut into it into that point and and then what I'm going to do is um, make sure I've cut through the sleeper as well and then this will just pull out of the way like so yeah so you've got a nice gap in there Time how long it takes the battery powered soldering iron to power up. I'm going to put my reading glasses on. I've turned the lights out in the shed so we don't get the glare. Um, I tried to film this earlier from up there and the glare just made the vision blurred. So yeah, we've got the track. I've just pulled it apart a bit more. We're going to get um, a piece of wire. ready so we'll strip that just like we do pull it apart put our wire strippers on it on the job and I still haven't oiled these Andrew no I know and I'm just gonna go back about quarter of an inch because it's narrower track isn't it than double O so I've just come back out of the kitchen, obviously, what I filmed earlier, just to get that in view. And uh, I might be able to alter the camera angle of the dangle. That might be a bit better. Just touch the screen to focus in. And then 
So I'm gonna bend these in, and as you see, the soldering iron's already heated up, and that's battery operated, so it's really good, isn't it? And then we're gonna get the helping hand on here. You don't have to use this, but it helps. And I'm gonna try it, because it's flux filled. So it should be all right without tinning it, but we'll see. That's it. Bit on there. <laughs> Blow the fumes away. That's his wire. Ready. Face mask on, but if I do that, I can't talk, can I? That's all right, this. So, yeah, we're going to offer it up now. Make sure it's all right. And remember, this piece is the piece that's pulled out. This is in a groove, as we've said. This piece doesn't tend to move. It's not like double O, but that piece has moved. So, if we keep it right up to this edge, try not to burn the, the foam back in. And then when we push it up, it should go right up between the sleepers. So we've only got a small gap, haven't we? So I'm gonna try and put a little blob in there now. Hold it so you can see. Have no light on. <laughs> what, could, what could possibly go wrong? As I said a while back on another video. I'm gonna give it 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's it. Oops, just spit a bit. And when it spits, it spits. I should really have fluxed it, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We're going for a blob there as well. That's nice. A bit more on that edge. That's nice as well. So we've got two blobs. And then it's either black to the back or red to the rear. But when you turn it over, this is going to be red to the rear. That's the way I do it. I'm going to try and hold it and solder it at the same time. Okay. Right up to that corner. That's taken, I think. And I've got as near as I can. So we're trying to blow the mist for soldering here as well. Are we still on camera? It's a bit hard for me to get my hand to the right angle so you can see. I'm doing my best. It's not going to work, is it? But let's have a look. Let's see if I can get that into the corner as well. That's it. Ooh, right, setting. And then we've got two nice little pieces soldered on. Our dropper feed wires without too much hassle. I'm just gonna push this grooved TT120 track. So it's very similar to double O, isn't it? Very similar, just that little odd bit of a difference. And without much manipulation or Beggaring about, I think you can see we've got we've got a good enough. Once we get the um, the ballast on there, and I manipulate that little bit, just bend the wire a little bit more out of the way, and then it'll push up. I thought I was going to burn myself then, but I didn't. It's all in my head. So yeah, we're nearly there. And that's, that's about good enough for me. That'll come down then. And of course, that'll drop through the bottom of your board with a five mil hole for this sort of size wire. And it's virtually invisible. There's nothing on the inside of the flanges. There's nothing really visible on the outside because we've only cut a little bit of wire. So it's not overhung. And once we get that ballast into the track, eventually one day, in the future, we shall see 
that everything is tickety-boo. Right, so this soldering iron can now be turned off. One press and it starts flashing. It either flashes like that when it's reheating the iron. So unlike the old iron that you saw before, it had no way of telling if it was at the right temperature or it wasn't. And as I used to say, this end it's loose now and when it heats up it gets even worse and so that stopped conductivity all right while well, it lasted but whew, I much prefer that so it's cooling off now and like I say if it's flashing when you haven't turned it off that's telling you the irons heating up again so just to wait I love it it's great under 30 quid all in all 12.99 for soldering iron and I think it was 14, 15, 99 for battery and charger. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. And I love it. And that's a Lidl special. <laughs> there you go. Right, so, where am I?